pray. Father in heaven, as we open your word this morning, may we be struck with the magnitude of the task you have given us in raising our children. May we realize the futility of attempting to raise godly children apart from the power of your Holy Spirit. May we be stirred up to the good works of Christian parenting. Please send your spirit with your word this morning and pierce our hearts that we may grow in grace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our sermon text this morning is from the Gospel according to Luke. You can find it in your bulletin. Uh, Luke chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. Luke 18, 15 through 17. These are the words of God. Now, they were bringing even infants to him, that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. This may seem like a break, in our series on Christian fundamentals, but I assure you that it is not. We've had sermons on worship, confession of sin, family worship, music and psalm singing, prayer, marriage, and now children. If you look around the room, you'll notice there are a lot of children in here. And praise God for that. But what are we supposed to do with these children? Besides, keep them alive and raise them to be bearable adults. Is the goal simply to keep them from drugs and promiscuity, or maybe even less than that, um, or not to push them away so that we can see our grandkids at Thanksgiving in 20 years? No. The goal is much loftier, impossible even, apart from God's grace. The goal is to train the next generation of God-fearing men and women to love God and to advance the kingdom of God one step closer to the gates of hell, which will not prevail against them. The goal is to bring our children to Christ and not to hinder them. But the evangelical church in America is losing her kids. A recent study from Lifeway gathered that 66% of those surveyed stopped attending church regularly for at least a year between ages 18 and 22. The survey was taken from young adults who attended a Protestant church regularly for at least a year as a teenager. These are Protestant kids, so we can't even blame Rome, which is a shame because we love to do that. The bar set by Lifeway, however, is laughably low. When you pray for your children, if you pray that they would simply stay in church from ages 18 to 22, you are criminally shortchanging them. We don't just want kids who stay in church but hate God. We want kids who outstrip us in the race to holiness. We want kids whose works of reformation and gospel impact stun us in our gray-headed years. We want kids who grow up and train up grandkids whose Christian walks blow us away as we marvel at God's grace. Children are an integral part of the Christian life, and up until very recently, a good and necessary consequence of marriage. If you browse the aisles at the Christian bookstore, something I do not recommend doing with your guard down, you will find a great deal of ink spilled over the subjects of marriage and parenting. Why? Because raising children is difficult. Maybe it's just me. (laughs) And because raising children is incredibly important. So important that raising faithful children is a biblical qualification for pastors and elders. When God gives you children, he entrusts you with something that will live forever. He gives you an image bearer of the one true and eternal God, and he says here, take care of her for me. No pressure, right? But this sermon is not about parenting exactly. It is about children. 
It's about children and their status in the church and the new covenant. In case you missed it, we baptized a few children here this morning, but this is not necessarily a baptism sermon. There will be very little water in what we cover here today. Why? Because not all important questions can be answered simply by consulting the concordance in the back of your Bible. You may be thinking, I've read the book of Acts many times, and I don't remember anything about young children being baptized. And you'd be right. Maybe. Uh, But the same method of concordance study will find you zero explicit examples of women taking the Lord's Supper or commands to give the Lord's Supper to women. So how do we defend our practice of welcoming women to the Lord's table? We go to passages like Galatians 3.18. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ. If we establish the status of women in the new covenant, then their status at the table takes care of themselves, takes care of itself. Or, since the Lord's Supper is linked to the Passover meal from Exodus, we could go look at the Old Testament example of our memorial meal and see that men and women, and even children, are welcome. Combined with the status of women in the new covenant, the case is closed. Of course women are welcome at the Lord's table. They are the Lord's people. The goal for today's sermon is to do something similar with the status of our children. The questions I hope to answer today are, what does the Bible say about children in general? What does the Bible say about children as members of the covenant? And what does the Bible say about children in the new covenant? My goal is not to convince you of the validity of the baptisms that you have just witnessed. My goal is to simply declare to you what God has said about your children and to encourage you in the monumental task of faithfully raising your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. As a disclaimer, um, before I jump in here, a great deal of the material from this sermon has been distilled from three major, three books that impacted me the most. Doug Wilson's To a Thousand Generations, Baptism is Not Enough by John G. Crawford, and Joel Beakey's Parenting by God's Promises. I have them with me. If you want to take a look at them at lunch, feel free to, or at least grab the names, let me know. Okay, so what does the Bible say about children? Well, quite a bit, naturally, and most of it is good. In Exodus 20, verse 5, in the giving of the second commandment, God says this, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. Your children are affected by your disobedience, but they are much more blessed by your obedience. And the ratio of blessing to curses is hugely slanted towards blessing. It's about a thousand to three or four, depending upon whether God curses you to three generations or four. To double down on this point, take a look at Deuteronomy 440. Therefore, you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, that you may prolong your days in the land that the Lord your God is giving to you for all time. Just one page over in Deuteronomy 7, verse 9, God says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. A brief sweep of the Psalms, or maybe not so brief sweep of the Psalms, will uncover many glorious statements about children. Psalm 22, verse 30 says, Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation, they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Psalm 37, verse 25 says, I have been young and am now old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, or his children begging for bread. Psalm 72, verse 4 says, May he defend the cause of the poor, of the people, Give deliverance to the children of the needy and crush the oppressor. Psalm 78, verses 5 through 8. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel 
which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation may, might know them, that the children yet unborn, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God. Psalm 90, verse 16. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Psalm 102, verse 28 says, The children of your servant shall dwell secure. Their offspring shall be established before you. Interestingly, this verse is immediately after verses 25 through 27, which are quoted in Hebrews 1.10 about the supremacy of Christ above everything. But of the Son, he says... And then we read that the the children of your servants shall dwell secure. Psalm 103, verse 17 through 18 says, But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. Psalm 112 says, Praise the Lord. Blessed, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Psalm 115, verse 13 says, He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. May the Lord give you increase, you and your children. Psalm 127, verse 3 is a great coffee mug verse. In fact, I actually have a t-shirt with it on it. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. One of the reasons that Psalm 127, that the man of Psalm 127 is blessed is because his children are arrows in his quiver when he speaks with his enemies. But for 66% of American evangelicals, those grown children are fully formed arrows in our enemy's quiver. Psalm 128 should feel familiar since we sang it today. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat of the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. One of the blessings of a God-fearing man is little olive shoots around his table. Fruitful olive shoots. Olive shoots that produce children's children. Psalm 147, verse 12 says, Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. Okay, so you get it right. The Psalms say a lot about children. But what about the prophets? Isaiah 59, verses 20 through 22 An explicit promise of the new covenant age says this, And a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or the mouth of your children or the mouth of your children's children, says the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Isaiah 65, verse 22 says, In a description of the new heavens and the new earth, mind you, Isaiah says, They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. In Jeremiah 32, Verse 38, while promising a restoration of Judah after the Babylonian captivity, God says this, They shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for their own good and for the good of their children after them. 
I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing them good. For the good of their, I'm sorry, for, the good, for their own good and the good of their children after them. Some of the strongest language in the Bible concerning children is found in Ezekiel 16. Actually, some of the strongest language in all of the Bible period is found in Ezekiel 16. So if you're looking for a particularly interesting chapter for family worship this week, flip open to Ezekiel 16 and strap in for a memorable ride. The whole chapter is a rebuke from God to his people for their spiritual adultery. In verse 21, God says to his people, And you took your sons and your daughters whom you had borne to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Were your whorings so small a matter that you slaughtered my children and delivered them up as an offering by fire to them? When God's people bear children, they bear children to God. Our children belong to God. They do not belong to Molech or to Caesar or to any other false god. They are God's children. They are to be dedicated as an offering to him and to him alone. Our children are not short heathen dedicated to Molech or Dagon or any other pagan deity. Our children are short Christians, and they belong to God. Later on in Ezekiel, in chapter 37, the famous prophecy of the Valley of Dry Bones ends with this glorious promise of the new covenant, starting in verse 24. My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever. And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will set them in their land and multiply them. And I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My dwelling place shall be with them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel. When my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. In an explicit promise of the new covenant age. Where God promises to bring all his people under one shepherd and king. God promises to establish a covenant with them and their children and their children's children. To round out our survey of the Old Testament, we hit Malachi 2.15. In chastising Israel for infidelity to their own wives, their earthly wives, Malachi says this, And what was the one God seeking? A godly offspring. God desires a godly offspring. Are our children in the New Covenant age godly offspring? Yes, they are. 1 Corinthians 7.14 says that the children of even one believing parent are holy, set apart, saints. Just like the slaughtered children of Ezekiel 16, our children belong to God. They are set apart to Him and no one else. With a swath of Old Testament text as the background, hear again these words from Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. And the point here is not to connect the word baptized and children, but to show the continuity between the Old Testament promises and the birth of the Christian church at Pentecost. All throughout the Old Testament, but especially from Abraham to Christ, Children are included in the covenant, and they are numbered among the covenant people. 
There is plenty more in the New Testament regarding children, especially in our sermon text from Luke 18 and its parallels in Mark 10 and Matthew 19. In Luke, infants, even infants, are brought to Christ that he might touch them. Being good, focused adults, the disciples start to brush away the parents, rebuking them for wasting the Savior's time with trifles such as blessing an infant. But Jesus does the opposite. He tells his disciples to let the children come to him, and he even warns them not to hinder the children. Now there's a lot we could say about this verse, but I want to focus on three main points. The first is that Jesus considers an infant brought to him, excuse me, brought to him by a believer to be coming to him. The infant didn't walk up to Jesus. He was carried by a parent. He was brought by another, by somebody else's faith. But Jesus says, let the children come to me. The second point, which is much bigger, is what Jesus says next. He says, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God belongs to the little children brought by their parents. The kingdom belongs to them. This is is important. When the disciples attempt to shunt the little children off to the side, Jesus doesn't just say that they're welcome. He says the kingdom belongs to them. Far from being second-class citizens, little children, infants even, are the ones to whom the kingdom belongs. The third point, which is also significant, is that Jesus entreats his disciples to be more like the children. He says, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Far from discrediting the faith of a little child, Jesus holds their faith up as the standard. In most evangelical churches in America, this is flipped on its head. The children are told that their faith is incredible. Their faith isn't the standard the adult faith is. Yes, she says she loves Jesus, but she doesn't really understand what that means. Well, maybe she doesn't fully understand what it means to be a Christian, but that's the faith that Jesus holds up as the example to imitate. The simple faith of a child. Far from brushing off the faith of our children as somehow less legitimate than ours, we ought to imitate their faith. We ought to pray for our, our faith to be more like theirs. I know I said three points, but the fourth one is free. Sometimes letting our children come to Jesus means giving them up like Job. Sometimes we have to reluctantly obey when Jesus says, let the children come to me far too soon for our comforts. Sometimes it's at 17 weeks gestation, or age 7, or age 35. Sometimes let the children come to me means more than faithfully training up your kids. But it always means entrusting them to the arms of Christ. Made it. So the Bible has quite a bit to say about children in general, and even the children of believers in the New Covenant. But what does it say specifically about the status of children in the covenant? Let's go back to the institution of God's covenant with Abraham in Genesis 17. Bill read this for us this morning. In Genesis 17, God makes a covenant with Abraham, and he gives circumcision as the sign of that covenant. Listen to the covenant promises found in verse 7. And I will establish my covenant between you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Now, You may be thinking, what does circumcision have to do with anything? But the question at hand is, 
what did circumcision represent? And the answer is that it represented regeneration. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, after 40 years of wilderness wanderings and the second giving of the law, Moses says this, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. The prophet Jeremiah in in chapter 4, verse 4 says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts. In chapter 9, verse 25, God declares through that same Jeremiah, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish all those who are circumcised merely in the flesh. Egypt, Judah, Edom, the sons of Ammon, Moab, and all who dwell in the desert, who cut the corners of their hair, for all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in heart. Anytime you hear Egypt, Edom, sons of Ammon, Moab, and then Judah linked in the middle, that is not, that is not good. And of course, in the New Testament, we find things like Romans 2.28. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And again, in Philippians 3, verse 3, Paul says, For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. In Colossians 2.11, Paul says, "In In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Circumcision, even back at the beginning, represented regeneration. The picture was always of the cutting off of the old man. And if all this talk of uh, foreskin and circumcision makes you uncomfortable, just remember to go home and read Ezekiel 16, and you'll feel better. So, who were the rightful recipients of the sign of circumcision given to Abraham? One of the rightful recipients was Ishmael. Not Isaac, Ishmael. Even after God explicitly rejects Ishmael as a child of promise, telling Abraham that he would instead establish his covenant with Isaac, Ishmael is still given the sign of circumcision. Why? Ishmael's circumcision circumcision doesn't represent his own regeneration or his own claims on the promises of God's covenant to Abraham. Ishmael had no land promises and no stake in God's covenant with Isaac. But Ishmael was covenantally connected to Abraham. Ishmael's circumcision is a sign of Abraham's faith and status, not his own. Ishmael is given the sign of God's covenant with Abraham because he is under the covenantal authority of Abraham. So were Abraham's male slaves. All of the men in Abraham's household, irrespective of their status to God's promises, are commanded to take the sign of circumcision. Abraham's servants had zero land promises to bank on. They had no promises from God to establish his covenant with them or their offspring. Yet Abraham's servants, like Ishmael, are rightful recipients of the sign of circumcision because they fell under the covenantal authority of Abraham. This same structure of authority is why your children are given your last name at birth and granted American citizenship at birth. My children are American citizens because they were born to Americans. This process of circumcising all male converts and all male infant children is continued throughout the Old Testament, even into the New Testament. In fact, it causes quite a stir in the foundation stages of the church. 
after Paul, in, in Acts 21, after Paul returned from Jerusalem, from, I'm sorry, returned to Jerusalem from missionary work among the Gentiles, some Jews had their hackles raised in opposition to this newfangled Christianity, especially the inclusion of Gentiles. One of the charges falsely leveled, falsely leveled against Paul in Acts 21:21 21, 21, is that Paul had been telling Jewish co- converts to Christianity not to circumcise their children. Knowing that this teaching, the teaching that children were now excluded from the covenant and no longer to receive the sign of the covenant, would have caused a riot in Jerusalem, the Jewish brothers in Jerusalem talk Paul and his companions into purifying themselves at the temple so all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you. Acts 21, 24. There is often a temptation in American evangelicalism to say, yes, but that was then and this is now. That was the old covenant and this is the new covenant. Jeremiah 31 says the new covenant is not like the old and that all the members of the new covenant know the Lord from the least to the greatest. In our survey of the Old Testament promises concerning children, Old Testament promises concerning children, we hit Isaiah 65 and Ezekiel 37, both containing explicit promises concerning the children in the New Covenant. It is important to note, though, the practice of giving the covenant sign to children precedes the covenant with Moses. The covenant given at Sinai is the covenant referred to as the Old Covenant, and circumcision goes all the way back to Abraham. But the New Testament itself has much to say on the continuity between the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, and the New Covenants. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul exhorts the Christians in Corinth in this way. Largely Gentiles, in fact. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things took place to them as an example for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, gungasmoon, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example. But they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. There's your explicit reference in the New Testament to infants being baptized, by the way. Baptized in the Red Sea. Paul draws similarities to the Exodus at exactly the same place that we are tempted to draw differences. We say... This is a different covenant. Paul says, our fathers were under the cloud and in the sea. We say, we have baptism and the Lord's Supper and Christ. Paul says, so did they, and their bodies are scattered in the wilderness. We say, you can't fall away from the new covenant. It's a covenant from the elect only. Paul says, let anyone who stands thinks that he stands, take heed lest he fall. The olive tree in Romans 11 is the clearest picture of continuity between the covenants. Starting at verse 17. But as some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. 
That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. The olive tree of Romans 11 is a tree that spans the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, and the New Covenant. You could argue even further back. It is one tree with many branches. The olive tree has Jewish branches that grew on the tree naturally. They were not grafted in. They grew there. But they're cut off for their unbelief. The olive tree also has Gentile branches, wild olive shoots, grafted into a tree that isn't theirs by birth. But branches are being cut off of the olive tree for unbelief. Now, we must stress at this point that you cannot be cut from salvation. You cannot fall away from salvation once you have been given it. God keeps his elect. If you have been given by the Father to the Son, the Son will keep you. He is a perfect high priest who loses none that the Father has given him. But you can fall away from the, Roman, from the olive tree of Romans 11. That means that the olive tree of Romans 11 isn't the tree of salvation. Because you can be cut out for unbelief. It is the tree of the covenant. There are Jewish branches that really grew on the tree. They started as buds and they grew into full-size branches. But they are cut off. And they're cut off for a lack of faith. It would not have been an appropriate response for a Roman Christian to write back to Paul and say, No, Paul, you're mistaken. Branches cannot be removed from the olive tree in the New Covenant because the New Covenant cannot be broken according to Jeremiah 31. Paul, in Ephesians 6.1, links Ephesian children to God's covenant with Moses when he exhorts the children in Ephesus in this way. Children... Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first command with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Paul quotes commandments given to Moses on Mount Sinai and applies them to Gentile children in Ephesus in the New Covenant age. The same Paul, as we have already noted in 1 Corinthians 7.14, teaches the children of a believing parent are set apart, holy, hagias, saints. God doesn't change his mind in the new covenant. He doesn't introduce a radical paradigm shift to how his people relate to their children. He does not say, I made a whole bunch of promises back there about children and grandchildren, but I've changed my mind. That paradigm didn't work. I overpromised back there, so the new paradigm is individuals only. You can no longer grow naturally on the tree, olive tree of Romans 11. All branches since Pentecost are grafted in one by one. No, God did not overpromise, and He will not underdeliver in the new covenant. He gave you your kids, and He wants you to keep them. So what do we do with this information? Well, after you've been crushed down to your knees by the pressure of raising God's children, children given to you by him and for him, stay there for a while. Pray. Thank God for your children, for his children. Thank him for the promises to be God to you and to your children after you. Beg him for his covenant mercies on your children. Ask him to grant your children faith and repentance from the earliest age. One of the things we pray regularly for our children is that they grow up never knowing a time when they did not love God 
and want to worship him with their whole heart. So pray and ask God for the strength to put in the hours necessary to not hinder your children in coming to him. Then get up. Straighten your shoulders and get to work. Pray with your kids. Read them the Bible. Even Ezekiel 16. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Sing the Psalms. Confess your sins to them. Ask for their forgiveness when you need to. Love them. Spank them. Discipline them. Get up in the morning and read your Bible and pray. Let them see your faithfulness every day. Sing around your dinner table. Gather the family for worship regularly. Teach your kids how to pray. Teach them how to think. Read them good stories. Every minute of every day, bring them to Jesus. Do not hinder them. And to the church, notice that it was the disciples, not the parents, hindering the children from coming to Jesus. Bring your kids in and let them sit where God's people sit. Show them what God's people do. Then, after a long day of all that work, before you collapse into bed, hit those knees again and ask God to save your children. Ask Him for the strength to do it all over again the next day. And as with everything in the Christian life, do it by faith. Trust God with your children. Bring them to Him and trust Him to keep them. Amen? amen. Oh, and baptize them. And you already said amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for our children. Thank you for giving us your children to raise. Thank you for the promises concerning our children to be God to us and to our children after us. Help us to raise our children, born for you, to love you and worship you. Help us to entrust our children to you. Help us not to hinder our children, but to bring them to you. May our homes be full of joy that comes from a family in fellowship with clean hands and confessed sins. May we taller Christians model for the short Christians and give them a worthy example to imitate. Keep our children, Lord, and use us and our lowly efforts as the mean to do so. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.